The August 11th, 1992 school board meeting is called to order. The first item on our, our agenda for this evening is adjustments to the agenda. Um, Rosemary Reed has asked under the school board subcommittee that the community team report be given. So we will add that as item number D. Are there any other adjustments to agenda? Um, it is noted that uh, Jan Solon is not in attendance this evening. All other school board members are present. Um, approval of the school board, mi school board minutes, organizational meeting Monday, June 8, 1992. Are there any adjustments? Seeing none, they stand approved. Um, the regular meeting of Tuesday, June 9, 1992. Um, there is a revised copy in your folder provided by Connie Brown. There were three errors that she has corrected that were brought to her attention before this meeting. Seeing none, uh, they stand approved. Uh, next is communications. Um, I will yield first to the superintendent. Well, I didn't uh, include any in the uh, in your regular packet. I have brought a couple of articles, and uh, some of which were sent to me, called to my attention by parents, and a couple of uh, informational articles uh, that we've shared among staff, but no formal communications. Anything that I have as a formal communication is under my report. I have one communication from the superintendent's office. There will be undertaking uh, high school nurse interviews on Thursday, August 20th. There are th six interviews set up. If anyone from the board is interested in serving on that committee, could they please uh, notify Connie Brown or Connie Goldman? Uh, again, that is on Thursday, August 20th, and there are six interviews scheduled. Uh, that ends our communications. Next is the superintendent's report update on summer construction projects and kindergarten move. Okay. If you've been by the high school, you know that the uh, construction project is very visible at this point. There's a new outside doorway. Um, there has been a good deal of renovation um, in the corridors, lockers removed and so forth. Reaching the point now where things will fall into place fairly quickly. Unfortunately, as I noted in your agenda notes, uh, that's why we, I recommended that we not bring the students back in until after uh, Labor Day. Uh, we're waiting for carpeting. Um, and it's one of those things that you keep wondering with, uh, you know, we, even, we weren't particularly fussy about what color came. We had two or three different colors. It was not a particular issue. But um, anyway, that's going to hold us up a little bit. However, we have discussed this issue with the kindergarten teachers, um, and they're satisfied that they can get their materials ready and so on and they will be in there uh, we hope as early as the 24th which should give them plenty of time we have also on order uh, various shelving and um, storage and things that are appropriate for kindergarten because some of the storage materials uh, really can't be moved from Pond Cove and of course they were using closets so they will have plenty uh, as far as we know that those should come in on time but you always kind of keep your fingers crossed been a tremendous amount of work done um, both by staff uh, and by administration and by parents who were involved with Project Swing. Um, that certainly is coming along and there have been timelines published on that in the Courier. Um, there will be some uh, construction going on as people I think are aware, the parents helping put up the actual um, gym equipment that's going to be outside, the playground equipment. However, interestingly enough, there's a great deal of preparation even for something as simple as adding a little bit of equipment. You have to decide what the um, material you're going to have below the equipment. There are certain decisions that have to be made. We're trying to make them with handicap access in mind also uh, because we have, in fact, as you're aware, started an ADA um, handicap access uh, system-wide committee. 
we have, for instance, in the renovation at the, uh, on the kindergarten wing, made sure that the doorknobs, door handles, which were noted as part of our uh, necessary renovations throughout the system, really, those have been done in the course of renovation. We've also added uh, handicapped toilet stalls to the boys' and girls' bathrooms that are there. So there's uh, just a long list of things we'll try to summarize uh, when we are finally finished to give you a sense. And obviously, we will be having tours. Um, some materials gone home to kindergarten parents, giving them uh, a, an overview of how they will be included in all of this. Uh, we thought it prudent to hold parent orientation actually on the first day of school, which is uh, September 8th, rather than bring the children in because, again, we are concerned about how quickly all of the material, the books and materials that the teachers need, given the fact that we're a little slower than we hope to be. Um, and again, that information has been sent out. Parents are aware of it, I hope, by this time. And certainly any questions, the Ponco office will be open beginning in the, uh, excuse me, the 24th. And uh, we certainly will be answering, we know, phone calls and so on. Uh, I did put a little piece in the courier. People probably saw, I think it was Joel Burr scraping uh, gum off the bottom of something or other, I think it was a desk. Um, and I certainly intend to feature some kind of summary information for you as well as for the community at large. And a tremendous amount of cleaning, um, upgrading. Uh, some rooms have uh, had corners cleaned that apparently haven't been cleaned for 20 years. Um, I want to compliment both Sue Weatherby, Bob Bennett, who has been organizing our uh, high school help, and certainly the uh, youngsters who have been working on that project, to say nothing of all of our custodial maintenance staff. Um, the reorganization that Sue has been involved with is working quite well for us. We're really getting some results. More on that a little later. Last piece on that, the, uh, we now have the uh, organized bus routes. I again put a reference to that in the Courier. They will be published in the next edition of the Courier, which is 5th. It will be the September 5th. Um, addition and uh, we the changes that are being made are mostly small changes. Uh, Sue and I are looking at those very carefully trying to be sure that we don't pull any surprises. The one point I want to emphasize is that in reorganizing some of those transportation routes we are going to be able to bring children in for Pine Cove in the middle school on one lift and if you're not sure what I mean by that I mean that we have been having many youngsters have to wait for the second round of buses um, and that has resulted in students having to wait outside in, in good weather or inside in a restricted area in bad weather uh, which has created not only a supervision problem for schools but I'm sure is not uh, particularly uh, enjoyed by the students either and I know that many parents have felt that that was a problem one way or the other uh, so in order to gain time, we will ask students to walk a small amount, uh, and we will, of course, always take into consideration safety concerns, uh, where they're asked to wait, how many are waiting together, and so on. There will be no major shift from the patterns that people are used to, but I just want to alert you to the fact that there will be some changes. Uh, we'll be able to give you precise information through the courier and before that if you call the office once the office is open that is the individual school offices any questions on any of that? can I just ask because some parents have asked me how it's the fourth grade space has that been completed yes yet well it is essentially completed I know that the <coughs> shelving is in I'm not sure if all the desks are back and I know that was cleaned early on Maybe I better, I haven't been over there this week, so. Uh, the fourth grade space was one of the first areas to be cleaned, and it's, it is totally clean. Most of the teachers are, have been in there working. Um, there have been some chalkboards, white chalkboards, replacing some of the other areas. Um, and that one's in, it's in very good shape at this point. Uh, how about the lockers? I know that's something that the kids are concerned about. I know that they've been ordered, Ann, but I don't, I don't know okay. what the, arrival date. That what they're going to be doing is leaving the hooks there for the time being until those lockers arrive and then when they arrive why the hooks will be taken down. Kids want lockers. Yes. They Status symbol. <laughs> well they're coming and when they get there they're new but I, I just have to say that um, 
when you get into school projects and ordering things and so on. I guess it's no different from have building a house or anything else, but at the same time, um, having them ordered and having them arrive are two separate issues. They'll be there, however. Anything else? Moving on, and I don't intend to go into detail, I just want to note that we are having um, an administrative meeting. It says here retreat, but it's not a retreat. In the sense. We're not going anywhere. We're going to 1226. It uh, might be nice to go uh, to some uh, palatial uh, retreat, but actually 1226 works very well for us. We're starting to use it for staff development. I've uh, made use of it uh, three or four times now, and I really want to compliment the decision to use that facility. It works very well for a lot of staff development uh, issues. Uh, we will be reviewing a lot of nuts and bolts. Obviously, uh, we're moving something uh, like 45 classrooms, all the moves that we discussed last spring. They, we have some last uh, uh, minute staff changes or staff hiring, uh, which we'll be noting as we go down through here. I can see However, the light at the end of the tunnel, I can, we've been working hard on those issues, even though some of them have come in recently, and I'm confident we will be fully staffed and ready to go. But those are, uh, that kind of thing, uh, certainly we're dealing with. We also will, of course, be reviewing last year's goals, our mission statement, uh, and any preliminary uh, summary of goals, as you have given me those by this time, and uh, be ready to share with you are thinking about what the most uh, important priorities for the year are, what our problems may be, what, how we deal with them, and so forth. Um, again, you're invited to join us at any time if you wish, uh, although you know, just feel free. And uh, we uh, understand that we'll be having a meeting on goals workshop on the 24th. Is that, I guess that's something I would like to confirm before the end of the evening. That's okay. Okay, yep. moving on. Um, the next item on my report are the results of the fourth grade tests, and I included in your packet a, a fairly com complete summary of those scores, a breakdown of um, the last few years, some answer to the questions that were <coughs> raised last spring, and also uh, some uh, scores from the third, fifth, and seventh grade uh, California Achievement Test, and I did ask Lyle to be here to answer questions or to give you a little overview. Good evening. Thank you, Lyle. Would you like a quick overview, or would you like to uh, go straight to questions? What is the will of the board? Why don't you give a slight overview? Okay. okay, starting with the uh, results of the grade four testing, it's important, I think, to point out that the tests were given in January so that um, we should keep in mind that where this is August, these tests were administered and the kids' performance were measured as of about mid-year. Um, the fourth grade results were very similar to those results from a year ago. You can see that overall reading was up 15 points, the writing was down 10, uh, math was showed the greatest gain up 25, science was down 10, social studies was down 20, the humanity score was up 10 points. So that we had three scores going up, three scores going down. And if you were to add the total gains, the total losses, we would just about balance out exactly as, as last year. I think there's 10 points difference if you look at the whole six tests. Keep in mind that uh, 50 points is one standard deviation and, and the point at which a change becomes st statistically uh, significant. Uh, Mark. One of the other things I should point out too is that we had a few more absent well, not absentees, but a few more people, um, a few more students were excluded from the testing this year for a greater variety of reasons than is the usual case in the eighth grade and, and a different pattern than we've seen in the last few years. 
Mark. I just, I just wanted to make a comment on the fourth grade MEA scores. If, it, if you look at just compared to one year's history, it's three up, three down, m relatively minimal changes. But if you were to plot out these scores over the year's data that we have, you would see that for math, science, social studies, and humanities, you have a, a slope of a relatively even line. It bounces up and bounces down, but stays about a flat line slope. But if you were to do that to reading and uh, writing, there's a pretty consistent downward slope to the line. Although it bounces up and down a little bit, it's, it's a very consistent trend going down. And the gap that you just described, a standard deviation of being 50, mm -hmm. meaning a fairly sig statistically significant change, if you look at that in reading and writing, both of those have occurred in a consistent manner, going from 375 to 310, 335 to 280, changes of 65 and 55 for each of those. So while comparing it to one year's difference, there's little difference, but if you look at the slopes of those lines over the history of those curves, they're remarkably different. That's correct. Um, moving on to page two of the grade four report, one of the things that has happened this year is that the students with a handicapping conditions score has Im improved dramatically. And um, um, if you look at the next chart, you will notice that the the decline that that uh, Mr. Foray mentioned uh, has continued in the in the normal population, and the reason that the reading was up a little bit this year actually is because of a very dramatic gain in the scores of the handicapped students, and the non-handicapped students continued that uh, trend that you pointed out. Uh, what I've done in the chart at the top of the page is to compare the average student score of our handicapped student with those across the state, and then I have subtracted out the differences for you there. And you can see that our handicapped student population is a group, is about the average for the state as, a, as an average school district, so that our handicapped students, with the exception of reading and writing, uh, score, for the most part, above the state average for the non-handicapped students. And they're pretty close, actually, in the areas of reading and writing. And as I pointed out in the next, uh, in the next chart there, uh, this, I put this middle chart in because it refers to one of the requests that you made in the spring for additional information concerning grade eight. Well, in a, in the, in a um, future report here, um, you will notice that I provided that information for you. And considering you asked for it for the eighth grade, I gave it to you before you asked for it for the fourth grade. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess, self-explanatory as to where our students have scored as separated by handicapping condition or non-handicapping condition over the past seven years. And one of the things I should point out is that when you deal with such a small number of students as 15 to 10 or 20 students, you are going to have very significant fluctuations there are very dramatic fluctuations that really aren't that significant. Um, this is why I don't particularly point out to you that the scores of the handicap grouping in reading last year were 100 and are 225 this year. Uh, next year, they could be up a little bit or down dramatically just because of the different handicapping, the significance of the handicapping condition as well as the small number of students that are impacted there. So you're going to see those numbers go up and down dramatically, and it's hard to attach any meaning to that variation because of the very small number of students that you're dealing with. Uh, moving on 
to the other thing that is of interest usually to the school board. Um, I have listed the difference in scores between the boys and the girls. And as usual, the girls come out ahead. Uh, the girls scored 69 points more than the boys did in reading. Um, in humanities, they scored 30 points higher. The rest of the, the other four tests are amazingly equal. If there's anything I think abnormal about that is the fact that they are so close because usually you have more difference than that. As we've seen in the past, and you'll notice that at the state level across the state, the differences are greater. But that, those, those uh, four, four or five scores are amazingly consistent with the reading being the one subtest where the girls score much better. Do you have any further questions about the grade four MEA results? Just to add to Mark's comments about the, the dramatic change in the reading and writing downward, if you look at the reading and you take out the handicapped, there's a 65 difference overall trend down and if you take out the handicapped, it's, it represents a 66 trend. So it's, it's our average and above average students that have been declining in reading. And it's our handicapped that have been getting better every year. If you look at the writing, overall it's a 55 point uh, drop. But if you take out the handicap for our average above average students at 73, so it's even more dramatic. Um, the handicap have actually gotten better, but our general population is, is decreasing faster than they're increasing. Is there any explanation of why our general population non-handicapped are doing worse? I mean, a 73 and a 66 spread is, I think, more than one standard deviation, you're almost getting into one and a third. I think there are a number, of, a number of thoughts. I certainly have my own, but I would defer that to the principals and the curriculum people because I think that that's more of a curriculum issue than it is a statistician's report issue. And uh, um, my, I'm not a curriculum person, I'm not a reading person or a math curriculum person, so uh, I would defer that discussion or pass that on to the administration, I guess. Has, has the elementary principal or co-principals had time to evaluate uh, this year's results? We have not spent a great deal of time at this point, Charlie, investigating uh, the specifics of decline in terms of, uh, as Mark has mentioned, if you look at the, the decline for this year particularly, it's not, it's not particularly alarming, but if you look at the downward trend over the last several years, it does become of great concern. We're certainly well aware of that. In response to your question, there are some things that we are doing, but we have not completed uh, or anywhere near finished our investigation of what we believe to be some of the, the real underlying reasons why there's a continued decline. Um, on the, if, if you begin to look at the introduction to MEAs, one of the two things that strike me very, is very, very significant. Are, is the fact that the MEAs are an accountability factor for, for what we're doing with kids, whether we like it or not. They, they're here to stay, apparently, for a while. We need to um, re-examine our perspective on the way I think that we're teaching our children. And I think that's happening through some of the community dialogue, through some of the uh, language arts work that we're doing with kids. Those, those are some of the things that we're doing in terms of looking at what we do with youngsters. The other piece is if you look at the introduction to what the real goal for, for having our MEAs might be is the improvement of instruction. 
and that's, I guess, where we are. Um, we, I've spoken to Lyle at some, some degree about some of the specific things that we might do. One of the things that has come to light, and I spoke um, with several of the teachers and with Lyle, I believe that we need to spend more time talking with our um, elementary teachers, K-4, particularly K-3, about what are some of the rigorous demands of MEAs. And I think that uh, we need to put more focus on what are the kinds of skills that we need to help our kids understand and focus on. Uh, that's, that's one specific that I think that we have not <coughs> spent a lot of time on. I, I've spoken to several teachers who were really unaware as, at the lower levels as to what, ME, what kids are really asking it to do with MEAs. They have specifics about what they're doing in their classroom curriculum, but they don't really have an overall picture of what the demands are for kids. And I think we've been remiss in that area, and we really need to spend more time in that. That, that's one thing. So this dialogue has started? It's definitely started. Is this something that you could come back and report to us, um, say, in October? I'd be happy to do that. To keep us updated? I, I think we need to be on, on task on this, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. board needs to be kept informed and not wait until the MEA results come out before we, we start asking questions. Mark? The, this certainly has been addressed in over a long time, the language arts subcommittee has been addressing it for an extended period of time the entire last year. Uh, but I, I do feel a need, as you do, to have some type of formal presentation from administration mm -hmm. what the assessment of our current and, and most recent curriculum has been, uh, what the plans are for um, improving the curriculum, and you know, to some extent what that is based on uh, so that we can, as a board, can have an idea what direction it's going and can formally address those concepts. I'd just like to offer another specific that, we're, that we have initiated at the K-4 uh, unit this year is formalized uh, opportunities for teachers to meet on a regular basis with the focus being language arts during the school day. Those meetings will happen uh, once every six days for teachers with a specific focus being language arts. One of the requests and one of the um, goals of the uh, language arts committee is for each grade level to clearly identify the uh, skills that each grade level might is responsible for or would be umbrellaed under that grade level. Those are the kinds of things that we will be working on and I'd be very happy and Beth, Beth and I together would be very happy to put something together and speak to you about the specifics of what, what is happening uh, to address this issue. Did we send another person for reading recovery training this summer? Yes, we will be training uh, Margaret Lewis at the, she'll be, she's transferred to the elementary unit and she will be involved in reading recovery this year. Loretta? Uh, since the numbers for the handicap scores are, in three of the six cases, higher than the state average. The scores, you mean? The scores. Right. Uh, does, does that say something for what we consider handicapped? <laughs> well, I'd really have to defer that to, to uh, the director of special ed. I would like to also uh, point out when we're looking, Lyle and I spoke a bit about this, the scores and the increase of scores here. There are a couple of things have happened this year and uh, one is the, the special ed folks have spent a considerable amount of time. They were very concerned about the scores last year and Wayne can speak to that. Uh, of course, those, we, we're talking about two different groups of youngsters. That has, that's a factor, that's a variable. But we're also talking about um, ways that we're instructing kids and I think that this definitely speaks to a change in some of our instructional practice. And um, I think the special ed folks are to be commended and the youngsters, they've, they have tightened up on what they were doing with kids. They've, in essence, in some situations that I'm well aware of, have gone to more intense skill instruction with kids, if you might, if you would. And I spent considerable time talking to Peg Lewis about this. And 
I think that the results are fairly I'm evident. I'm especially pleased that the, the math score is 20 points higher than the state average for our handicapped students. Well, that's, so that's, that's correct. And then the writing, if you look at the writing, there's not a significant difference there right. between our average scores and but the... When, you, when you're instructing um, handicapped classes, are, are they more often than not reading, more so reading directed? Is that the emphasis? Definitely. Well, it depends upon the identifying condition or what, what the youngster is, what the IEP might be for that youngster. I mean, if a child is here, obviously, for math, you'd be doing math, but there's reading and all, you know, across the curriculum. But in speaking with folks this year, and uh, Shirley Willis was here, here with us this year, we'd spent considerable time talking about some strategies that might work with kids, and I... I I think that, that Peg particularly and Betty have employed uh, some, some new approaches. Any other questions? Anne? Um, I, I have to admit it's been really frustrating to me that, that continuously just watching the board and now being on the board that we don't have any formal um, procedure in place for really analyzing these scores. Um, getting the principals and the teachers together to look at them to evaluate their practice according to the scores instead of just arguing whether or not it's a good test or not. You know, we have a whole lot of scores here um, mm -hmm. from a whole lot of grades and a lot of tests, and there's some pretty significant things they're telling us. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a professional educator, but, um, you know, I assume that you're going to talk about the third grade scores, but it's pretty, pretty mm -hmm. obvious that some of the things that parents have been clamoring for, which is more drill work, more skill work, is, is desperately needed. And, you know, rather than just talking, talking, talking about it, can't we just do a little more of that? I'd like to go back to your um, initial comment about the report out in the studies and, and the, the uh, research that we do on the data that we receive from the state. Uh, I think... I'm looking around. I think maybe Peter the, was on the board. There was uh, an ex Michael Efren did extensive work analyzing met much of the uh, of the testing, the results that, that we received from testing. And the last uh, workshop that I sat in on was probably I don't know three years ago, maybe two years ago. I know um, John Holt was on the board and. Several of us sat until 12 o'clock one evening, and at which point um, we would be very, very happy to come back and to do lots of investigation and, and, and report to you the, uh, our findings. At that point, we were asked not to continue that way, to be, but to look at more specifics as to what you're suggesting, in and to see to come back with more information on uh, classroom practice, on um, make changes in the buildings more communication and so forth. So that, that's what has happened for us. Well, it just seems to me in order to know what, you're, what you need to be doing mm -hmm. in classroom practice, mm -hmm. you have to do the overall analysis. And you have to do it on an ongoing basis. I mean, as a system, we should be doing that um, so that you know, it's not a surprise when we get this incredible downward trend so that we're you know, paying attention to those trends all the time. We'll certainly take that to heart. Any more questions of the principal? Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, second memo responds specifically to the two questions that uh, you folks asked at the April school board meeting. And one was, how much have individual students improved or not improved? is a move from the fourth grade when they were tested to the eighth grade. Uh, 70, 76 of our students who were tested in the eighth grade were here and took the MEAs when they were fourth grade students. Uh, in the reading area, well first of all, before I talk about the pluses, minuses, and the ones who were in the same range, let me explain that I assigned a five point arbitrary figure to the increases, decreases, and considered uh, scores that were within 
five, a five point range from the grade four test to the grade eight test, I considered that no, no increase or decrease. So for those students who have the, who were designated as a, as a uh, zero gain or loss, that could be two or three points up or down. Um, if a student had made more than five points gain, uh, that particular student received a plus. And if that student's score was down five points or more in that four year span, then uh, it was assigned a minus. And in the area of reading, 29 students improved five or more points. Uh, 35 students declined five or more points, and 12 students stayed within that five point range. And then for your comparison, I listed the difference in school standard scores. And when you look at the school score in grade eight, it was 340. I mean, I'm sorry, in grade four, it was 340. And in grade eight, it was 355. In the area of math, there were 32 people who gained, 23 declined, with 23 remaining in the same score range. And when you look at the school scores, the scores, the score in grade four was 320, the score in grade eight was 400. And moving over to the writing, the writing was scored a little bit differently during the two years. In the fourth grade, the students was scored on a, on a uh, scoring uh, format that included um, many more numbers than the form that they used in the grade eight scoring, which gave a range, I mean a uh, single, or I'm sorry, yeah, gave a single uh, percentile. And what I did is if the single score scored fell within the range, and that was considered a plus. If the single score was above, it uh, received a minus, and if the single score was within the range that was given, I'm sorry, that was given in the eighth grade, then that was considered um, zero or no growth or loss. And when I did that, I found that 31 students had scores <coughs> that were above the range in the uh, fourth grade, 24 were below that range, and 18 students fell within the range. And if you look at the school scores, in 1988 in grade four, the uh, grade score was 295, and in grade eight, it was 330. That's a little confusing, Charlie. Do you know what percentage of this current eight the current eighth grade class at this time are handicapped of this 76? Uh, this class, when I looked at the, let's see, that, that is pointed out on the next page. Uh, there are 20, according to the report that I received, there were 21 students who are classified as having a handicapping condition in grade eight this spring. 15 boys and six girls. <coughs> Any more questions about the difference in scores between grades four and eight? Okay, the second question that you asked was how many more boys are classified in that handicapped student grouping than girls? And the answer is there are 15 boys and six girls. The um, scores in reading, and I think that when, we, when you folks asked us, we were talking specifically about the reading score. The average reading score for the boys, the 15 boys and the 24th 
percentile. Now, what, how, the way that I arrived, you cannot average percentile scores. So what I did was to take the raw score in reading for the, all of the boys, average the raw score, and then translated that raw score to a percentile score. And then I, again, subgrouped the handicapping condition, and you can see that 10 of the boys who have two uh, labels scored at the 17th percentile. The five students with another condition scored at the 41st percentile. In all cases, the girls scored higher. And when you look at the total number of boys and total number of girls, the girls' average score was 46 percentile to 24 for the boys. And if you take, I think there were approximately 100 students that took the test in grade 8. And if 15 of those students scored at the 24th percentile, I'm fairly certain that that would account for most of that gender difference. And if you, what I did beyond that is to, is to uh, do what I did in the fourth grade report, and that is to list the handicap average score for each subtest for each grade level over the past six years. And you can see that the pattern that that exists at the eighth grade level is quite a bit different than the pattern that exists in grade four. Although there are some areas where the handicapped group have some very high scores from grade eight, they don't, they're not equal to those in grade four. As I pointed out in my last paragraph, is kind of a summary. Um, I do have uh, specific lists of <laughs> students that uh, whose scores I looked at, and uh, if you want to see how large some of the gains are, how large some of the losses are, uh, if you want to uh, sit down with me as a group, or a group of you want to sit down with me. What I will do is cross those names off <clears throat> and discuss the uh, individual scores with you without the names attached. Uh, if any of you folks or the administrators want to do that, that is, uh, that is something that can be done. Any other questions from the board? Mark? Just one comment. I, at the previous board meeting, when these were requested, I think you completely answered the questions, and I think you did a very nice job. Thank you. We want to thank you for a considerable amount of work, and it's much easier to see in this presentation, I think, than any previous other presentations that's ever been given since I've been on the board, and we thank you for your efforts. Thank you. The Rosemary? Oh. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, and the reason I didn't ask any questions is because I fully understand. Um, the third memo lists the scores of the California test, the comprehensive test of basic skills. This is the test, this is the test that is replacing the SRAs. Um, table one, I guess, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, grade three scores are listed there for reading and all the subtests. The language arts is there with the subtests. Under math, comp means computation. C and A means stands for concepts, concepts and application. The total test battery include those three scores, and then there are individual subtest scores of spelling, study skills, science, and social studies. These scores overall 
pretty much follow the same kind of pattern that you see in the MEAs from my perspective. Um, probably if you were to translate the, look at the average percentile score for the grade, which is not given on the MEAs, grade fours would probably be pretty close to something between the, MEA, the uh, CTBS scores between grades three and five. You can see you can see that those, for the most part, average mid 60 to mid 70th percentile. The fifth and sixth grades improve a little bit, and then the seventh grade scores overall improve quite a bit more. And probably the eighth grade MEA scores, if they were translated to percentile scores would look more like the seventh grade scores than they do the third grade scores. Uh, those scores are not given in average student percentile scores in the MEA uh, evaluation. And it wouldn't be statistically allowable to compare those two scores anyway because your base groups are, are totally different. The MA, MEA scores are based on a comparison to state of Maine students. These CTBS scores are based on a national sampling of students all across the country. So you really shouldn't, even if we could, you really shouldn't make that kind of comparison. But again, my observation is that if, if that were to be done, those scores, the fourth grade scores would be pretty comparable to grades three and five. And grade eight scores would be pretty comparable to grade seven scores. On table two, the SRA test scores, what's EAS? Okay, that is educational ability score. And that is a brief test that is designed to measure a student's ability. One of the things that I've talked to the superintendent about is discontinuing that particular test. Um, we did give a test of cognitive skills, which is supposed to be an ability score for, that is uh, put out by the same people that published the CTBS scores. And those scores were all over the place. Teachers were very frustrated with them, and I think students were. And I really think that we should discontinue even administering those tests because uh, of the variability of, school, of scores and the weakness, the very significant weakness of the test. So uh, I think that Dr. Goldman will be maybe coming to you with either a recommendation or just a suggestion or a notification that we may be looking at discontinuing that part of the testing program. If we were to if we are going to uh, give a test to uh, take a look at measured ability, measured school ability, we need to go beyond something other than the uh, test of the test that was given this year. Wow, mm -hmm. are you suggesting that a test that would indicate the um, student's capacity or potential right. uh, be not included in the data or something? I wish, I wish there were one that you could rely upon more than you can those tests that we have given. Is it because the number has no validity or because the test cannot The test can't do what it says it's going to do with the small number of items that are given. And then at, at different points in time and in educational philosophy and school philosophy, I guess, there is some valid questions as to whether we should be looking at those scores anyway. And that's a, that's a second and separate but valid issue as well, I think. Okay, and then the second table lists the <coughs> SRA test scores for the last five years. Yeah. 
those are there for your information. It is very difficult to assess any particular pattern there. Table three is a table that simply takes the subtest scores and then looks at the, again, the, another smaller set of tests that are used to arrive at those subtests. For instance, reading is broken down into vocabulary and comprehension, and language arts is broken down into mechanics, usage, spelling. Math is broken down into computation, concepts, and problem solving. And then there are the reference materials, the social studies, the science scores given. This, the tests derived from the SRA tests over the last two or three years don't coincide with the current results that you're seeing on the CTBS scores. However, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the CTBS scores pretty much coincide with what we're seeing as results for the MEAs. But it doesn't come through in prior years on the SRA test scores. They're, they're much, much, much higher. The, the one thing that does match up is the seventh grade level scores on the SRAs over the last two, three years are fairly close probably a little bit lower, but fairly close to where the CTBS scores were this year in the seventh grade. But there's a big difference between grades three and four, five, or three and five. Yes? I just want to make a note that, that uh, on these SRA scores, the two areas that seem to be the lowest are math computation and spelling. And I'm sure that's been discovered, but I'd like to go on record as pointing that out. Yeah. And those are things that we hear about. The spelling about. and the mechanics in the language arts, too. The usage is much higher than the mechanics. The I think this, what this does is, is uh, authenticate the, the concerns of parents that on those two skills, that, that they're, they're weak and, and the test show that that could be true. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, continuing on with the superintendent's report, uh, school construction application results. Uh, Pardon? Oh, Beth? Uh, I think it's important that, that school board members are aware that at the end of August, August 26th and 27th, we're going to be working a, doing a language arts staff development work um, working with um, a couple of folks I think are going to be able to give us some insight and some help into the kinds of things that we that came out of the uh, language arts subcommittee over throughout the year that Ann was a participant on and Mark uh, and certainly would like to invite you to an, uh, that time period um, on the 26th in the morning Vicki Purcell Gates who is the Currently, this is the uh, director of the, the reading lab at Harvard is going to be talking to us basically about the need to do, to look at things in a reflective sort of way and giving us an overview of what is happening as far as uh, language arts and whole language and, and that kind of thing um, in, during that morning session. I think that in particular would be uh, of interest and valuable for, for folks to attend. Mark. Beth, I just wanted to congratulate you on bringing such a knowledgeable person to uh, our small town in Maine. Uh, I think that people who have that type of experience can be enormously helpful in directing us and lending credibility to the direction that we're going to take in language arts. I think should be very helpful. I think that uh, I, one of the biggest pieces that we need to look at is, is the reflective practice. And I think she has a lot of experience and background with that. And uh, the other participant, um, uh, Sally Lachlan, has a lot of uh, practice in, in the classroom and will bring a lot as well. Any further questions? 
or comments? Moving on. Moving on. Okay. And I just want to thank uh, Lyle too. I know there's a lot of work, you know, all that. And many of us have looked at a variety of ways of analyzing those reports. And I think that uh, we are well aware that uh, probably the bottom line is for teachers and parents to look at what individual children are, are doing against a set of standards and expectations that are well understood. Um, I personally believe that there's too much argument sometimes about um, what would be an ideal program and too little day-to-day -day, um, actual looking at the clues that children give us as to whether they're really reading with what level of comprehension. I know that that is the um, uh, the true issue for us is to get a handle on management uh, practices, not only in the classroom, but probably in a variety of subgroups, so that children get the kind of uh, feedback that they need in order to get better about a whole bunch of issues. Um, there is no one perfect program, and I think that that's one of the results that I saw happening this year, a good deal of staff and board and parent interchange uh, basically agreeing with that. Some people perhaps more so than others, but that, that's a direction we have to go in. Okay, moving on. School construction application results. I think I put, um, no, it hasn't been published. I just wrote a piece for the, uh, what do we call that? The municipal report, I think is what it's called. Uh, each department, including the schools, um, is asked to, um, if I can say the school is asked, get my agreement here. I've forgotten how I started that sentence. Anyway, I wrote a summary for that uh, publication, and I certainly try to surface what I see as one of our major issues. Uh, for general public information, uh, just to refresh people's memories, we did in fact put in an application for a major project at the middle school. When I was notified um, late in June what the status of that report was, we were one of 56 applications throughout the state. Uh, we were 36 on the list, and the state will be able to fund four. I don't think that there's much hope of solving our problems by waiting for um, an extended period of time to move on, move up on that list. When I talked to uh, Ted Ruark, the commissioner or whatever his title is, I think he's not a commissioner, but he's in charge of that particular division. He said, why were we so far down? Because when he came and looked at the building, um, he had certainly recognized our need, recognized the shabbiness, and in fact, some of the just plain very um, poor conditions that we have in that building. He said, yes, of course, all that is true. And we had discussed the fact that renovation in general is considered a local responsibility and not subject to funding by the state. But he said it was worth putting in because we were talking about some new construction. One of the major reasons we are not competitive at the state level is that we are not bursting at the seams if you take into consideration all the square footage in the schools. It's an obvious problem. We studied that with our school space study committee. We have moved to maximize our use of the high school. It's obviously one of the reasons why the kindergarten has been moved. Um, but the fact of the matter is we have an oversized high school and undersized other facilities and the state is dealing with some communities, many communities, that have no square footage available to them and must go to portable structures and that is where you get high points. Um, and it is a competitive issue. I think, therefore, my conversations uh, with our chair and with some of you individually, my recommendation to you is to uh, discuss um, a method by which we are going to put together a building committee. I included in this packet uh, some general information about the steps that go through as well as my own summarizing of this. I think that uh, we have in the past year alerted the community to the fact that we have major building problems and although that committee was originally called space study we've made the point I think quite clearly that the real expensive issue is renovation quality of that building itself therefore the uh, we have another meeting in two weeks I would be happy to listen to uh, any comments that you have or any instructions you have it is not up to me to appoint a committee uh, the usual uh, 
routine, of course, would be similar to what I believe you used in the uh, school space study committee, which uh, had appointments from the town council, appointments from this body, some citizens at large, uh, and that is, in fact, a fairly usual procedure. The point, the importance of a building committee, if you look at the state construction laws, whether it is funded by the state or whether it is funded by local funds, uh, there are very clear rules that govern state school construction. Things move faster if you get local money, to be honest with you, because you, you wait around year to year. I mean, uh, where we are on that list, I can't even resubmit that proposal until next uh, April. We'd wait to see how we competed in that pool, and it might be four or five years. We might float up a little bit, but every year there are extreme emergencies that occur, um, and even then, as I just to remind you what I discussed with you originally, we would only be getting up to the level of our own subsidy uh, on what portion of that uh, project would be allowable as a state project, and they would cut out most of the renovation. New construction, uh, some code work, um, so we would be getting, if, if even if our subsidy stayed at the same level, 29% of just as a, as a kind of guess of possibly one-third of the project. So if it's a $6 million project, we're talking about $2 million, 29% of $2 million uh, debt service, uh, which I thought was worth going out for and at least finding out where we stand. But I think a major issue is waiting around for the millennia while the windows fall out or the roof caves in or on well, the other, well, I don't think the roof's going to cave in. But <laughs> I shouldn't say that and <laughs> raise up old fears, but we're certainly going to be struggling with some leaks. And um, to say nothing of the dysfunctional uh, pieces of just getting around in that building. Therefore, uh, that building committee then is a key starting point. Um, my experience with building committees in the past has been it is helpful to have professionals, people who are engineers. Um, I think engineers, and I don't mean to sound, um, you know, discriminatory, but I have found engineers really helpful because uh, they bring a level of expertise to the discussion that most of us don't have. Um, but clearly, we also need a range of representation from other sources. We'll make sure we have town council representation and so on. Um, anyway. What would be an average workable number? Well, they vary considerably. Uh, I think for this kind of project, if we had, you want an odd number for vote purposes, uh, because there are many difficult decisions that this committee has to make, uh, because they will get guidance from you, but it is this building committee that actually is generally empowered to make design decisions as far as at least what goes out to the public and so on. I mean, you've got a chance to vote on that, but there are many piece-by-piece piece decisions that have to be thrashed out, and uh, so you need people who are um, able to get excited about those kinds of issues and, and deal with it, and, and there are votes, and you need the normal um, kind of thing. I would suggest seven. It's possible that you would want nine, but you would certainly want seven, and um, we need to decide the composition and how they'll be invited, and we have, I know we've, uh, I've had some Casual conversations with people who have indicated an interest, but again, it is not, I don't have the authority to appoint this committee. What I had asked the superintendent was to kind of give you an overview at this meeting and then to devote more time at our next meeting in two weeks. So it gave you t a couple weeks to think of questions and, and, and then make a decision at that time. If that's the will of the board, then we'll proceed. Rosemary. That, um, based on the amount of work that's going to be involved in this and the fact that people have um, full-time commitments otherwise, um, I would just um, request that we consider nine as opposed to seven, especially when we're dealing with several disciplines that might be able to be extremely helpful, helpful uh, in this endeavor. Uh, and uh, I think the sooner we get started, the better. Excuse me. The sooner we get started, the better, and that the discussion should be um, held immediately with the town council. And I think it should also be pointed out there is a considerable time involvement and commitment to anyone who either is appointed or joins this committee. 
um, they essentially see it through fruition to whatever extent that fruition is. Rose and uh, Loretta. Is, is this appointed by the school board or by the town council? I, I recall the building committee was appointed by the town council. Uh, both. So the school space, the school, yes, the school space, wasn't it? Was both. It both. Both? Both. both. need a mic. Is that me? No? Okay. Um, it is done in different ways in different places, but normally uh, it is certainly the town council is involved and certainly appoints its own representative and we may decide that one of the things we should be deciding in two weeks is what's the composition. Do you ask the town council for two appointees, the board two appointees and make up the, if, we, if it's nine, you know, what the, uh, we need, that, that is worth really thinking through how you want to do that. Um, the building committee, however, itself works more closely with the school department than it does with the town council. The town council is always involved because this will be a, whatever happens, it is a town building. And certainly from a funding point of view, the town council is extremely important. But the, uh, once the parameters of a project are determined so that you get a general sense of your budget, square footage, et cetera, which we basically have already gone through. But I should caution everybody, we have not been through concept design. And that's another, and I indicated to this in my little memo to you, that one of the things you have to do before you go out for a referendum is that you have to have enough of an idea of what it is you're going out for. So not only can you be fairly precise about the amount of money you're going out for, but also you have a sense of something that can be sold to the community because this is not, that's a very substantial problem. We know that we have to inform people. The times are not ideal for going out for major school renovation. Um, but we're going to, uh, I feel as your superintendent, uh, very strongly that we have to make a, our best effort to do this. Our, our, it takes you years to get a project of this size through and finished. Um, there are all kinds of issues that have to be, you know, there are timelines that have to be worked through. Uh, the most optimistic time frame we would be talking about, even if we went out to referendum in May and got uh, support from the town, we would have probably until the next summer before we turn to show. Well, maybe not, but at least that's a, a possibility. And all of that needs to be thought through and we need to um, talk about, well, how you fund the kind of work that has to go on with the experts before you actually go out and so on. I mean, there are bond anticipation notes, obviously, but the, um, and there are ways in which one, you know, standard procedures. We have, even if we fund this locally, we have to go through all the regular state approval forms. They do, in fact, go a little faster because the state board only meets and approves certain things basically once a year. Uh, and if you're not involved in school construction projects per se, you still have to go through the fire marshal, the state, the ECS, the B, um, you know, Building of Public Works, BPI, what did I say? Um, and oh yes, there's a human um, services one. I'm not exactly sure. I've never been able to figure out exactly why. I think that may, however, be tied to the handicap access piece, uh, which we've already folded into our thinking. So it's a complicated procedure. Uh, I wouldn't want to kid anybody. We're up against uh, a real interesting project. Let's look at the bright side. Kids can learn a lot from these projects. Um, they can look out the window and see all kinds of interesting things. Um, we'll all be learning a lot about what it means, but it is important, it is critical that building is simply not going to cure itself. How does the Pond Cove facility fit into this? I would recommend to you that I prepare and go out uh, at the October 15th date for a special project as we had talked about originally. We may not have any better luck with that than we are having with a major project, but because we are talking about a program piece in the gym that may in fact get a little, us a little higher up on the list. Um, I wouldn't be terribly hopeful, but I think it is worth a shot and we can only deal with one thing at a time. Peter. Now, I think that uh, before our next meeting, uh, I would suggest that uh, you contact the chairman of the town council and discuss this issue. Uh, and uh, my recommendation would be that you do that in the framework of uh, continuation of the School Space Committee, which was jointly appointed, as I recollect. Uh, I hope I recollect that clearly, because I think I was chairman and made some of the appointments, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure that it was uh, consisted of two school board members, two uh, town council members, 
and then a number of people that volunteered and some were appointed by the school board and some were appointed uh, uh, by the town council uh, that was a larger committee, I, I believe, than Rosemary's recommendation of nine. If anything, Rosemary, I would have said 11, but uh, it's always seven. how big was it? Who? It was, was it, I think it was seven, it was actually. Seven. Was it only and seven it was, people? It was one, you were on it, right? One, yeah. But she, was was as, she was as a public citizen. Yes, I was a citizen <laughs> no. at that time. In any event, it, uh, <laughs> it is, as Rosemary says, it's going to be an enormous commitment of time, uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, if, if going into uh, the, meeting two weeks hence, we knew what uh, you know, the town council's feeling was, more or less, that that would give us a leg up on those discussions. I have discussed this with uh, Michael. And I have also discussed this um, as within the past week with the chairman of the town council, but I will go back and talk to her some more. She was aware that we did not receive where our status was and that we were, would be discussing it tonight and it would be probably acting on it at our next school board meeting at the end of August. So she's aware of our time frame, but I will go back and talk about the composition. Good. Shall we move on? Yes. We're going to be talking about that a lot, in fact, I believe. Uh, okay. Um, two other issues on my list very quickly total quality um, I want to publicly thank Mr. Herbrow who is a uh, what I tend to call a Cape parent I mean we have a lot of Cape parents but uh, sometimes we uh, in a situation like this we've been very fortunate in having Cape parents come forward who also in their uh, other life are people who are consultants or experts who work in um, one capacity or another. <laughs> Last year we were very fortunate in having uh, some Cape parents who work at Unum in the total quality uh, division or who work in other divisions and interested in total quality uh, offer us some uh, staff development in that area and uh, recently we've had a, a occasion to work uh, with Herb Rao and um, uh, Bill Phillips uh, also working at uh, National Semiconductor. Uh, I th I'm very impressed with the willingness of our business community, our parents, and uh, others who uh, are at those institutions in sharing their thoughts about how hard it is to make change in the private sector and are willing to listen to us as we try to figure out how to think systemically, how to look at that whole issue of improving quality. Um, we are continuing with our total quality management meetings with our custodial and maintenance force, which we started last summer. Uh, Sue Weatherby is taking a real leadership role in that. And again, when I summarize some of our summer construction projects, I will certainly try to specifically highlight that for you and how, how this process is working. And I really do think it is working. I think we're going to see some continuing improvement in the, not only the way we manage those services, but in the quality of the results. I'd like to make one comment on the TQM that's been going on with the custodial and bus drivers. Having served on the negotiation team a year ago and, and having attended a meeting in July of, of this TQM, I was very impressed with the 360 degree turnaround of cooperation and what has been going on. So I was very impressed. Well, it's, uh, it's working on the system so that the system gets better and that people in the system can do a better job. And, and it really, uh, it's hard work and it's not something that's not a quick fix. Anything you ever read about total quality management or system improvement makes the point over and over again that uh, you absolutely have to get in there day in, day out and, uh, and make some tough decisions and deal with uh, issues with patience as well as uh, fairness and consistency, but ultimately you begin to see some results, and I hope that's happening. Moving on, I have one other committee I've started this summer that I want to explain to the board. I'm not sure the title is particularly uh, good or one that will last, but it was one, one we started with. We called it Teaching Tolerance. Uh, in all honesty, we had some incidents towards the end of the school that raised uh, my consciousness as well as those of people who were involved that um, we are a small community uh, in southern Maine. We lead, if by certainly world standards, pretty quiet pace of life. Many times some of the issues of diversity uh, are not day-to-day -day issues with us, or at least we don't think of them as day-to-day -day issues, and incidents can happen. 
misunderstandings can arise and we find ourselves uh, as parents and school people wondering how did we get so far apart. I'm reminded of the uh, wonderful series on public television that I suppose some of us are, are watching, I watch it when I can, a series of conversations that have been sparked by the LA riots, I guess, the can we get along. Um, I have been struck this year, this summer, looking at the newspaper, how many comments were from editorial writers, incidents, uh, not only here in Maine, but in all you know, national incidents, where as a people, our democracy is struggling with how do we deal with diversity. Um, and although we started this committee because of specific incident, incidents that had involved some students, uh, minority students, um, we are finding those of us who are in this um, uh, representative group, we have staff from all three buildings, we have some parents, we have, um, we have some board representation. Um, but we are finding that when we start trying to define diversity and diversity issues and how do we deal with diversity and how we fare, not only fare but celebrate diversity, that um, it's amazing to me how many issues are coming out. Um, in a community like this, we don't have a lot of racial uh, diversity, but when we do, we need to be well prepared how to deal with it, how to respect everybody's rights, um, how to deal with it with sensitivity and sympathy, compassion, honesty, forthrightness. Um, what, how do we deal with some of the religious differences that do exist in our community and how do we both model for children and possibly teach children how to talk about those differences uh, in a um, totally respectful stance? How do we deal with, uh, with children who are only children and who do things to each other that are not good? Um, how do we intervene and how do we make decisions about how to deal with that? Those are not easy things for us to determine and our point in this committee is to have a sounding board for that and then to make some decisions about whether we can add some uh, issues to a curriculum piece. Uh, many teachers, of course, are already talking about cultural, ethnic, religious, uh, socioeconomic diversity. Uh, as a literature teacher, I mean, I certainly, Lord knows, dealt with those issues from the Greeks on up. Uh, and. I don't think that this is a community or a school system that wants to be uh, insensitive, nor do I think that we are. But uh, the times are tough. We are dealing with cultural diversity on a wide range of issues. Um, and this is a form that we have started to try to give us a way of dealing with it. I would just simply connect that to our mission statement. We state it as one of our values that we want a, an atmosphere where we can all work together with mutual respect. Um, I think one of our problems is frequently um, when the unusual or what is unusual in our setting occurs, we simply don't know what to do. Uh, it's very easy not to know what to say. Uh, look what happened to Ross Perot, among others. Uh, it is easy to think you're saying something that is um, perfectly okay only to realize it can be taken in a different way. We have to learn how to talk to each other about difficult subjects. And that's a huge issue and we're having trouble focusing on it, but it seemed like the important thing to do to acknowledge that it is an issue that we can all have problems with and gradually we will sort it out and uh, come back to you with a report. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will now move on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first will be the finance subcommittee report from our chairman, Rosemary Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Finance Subcommittee did meet uh, and reviewed the revenues and expenditures for uh, year ending uh, June 30th, 1992. And I'm pleased to report that we received 99% of our projected revenues and we spent 98 point two, uh, I beg your pardon, 96.72% um, of our uh, budgeted expenditures. So we're well within acceptable. Um, numbers on both expenditures and revenues. Uh, I would also like to report at this time that uh, last night at the town council meeting um, there was a 7-0 vote to uh, uh, recognize the fact that the school department has received $65,910 from the state of Maine in unanticipated revenues which was uh, the result of an application uh, made in May of 91 
um, for three projects. $5,755 was credited uh, to Cape Elizabeth for the removal of uh, an oil tank at the high school, which has uh, yet to be done. 5775 for removal of an oil tank at the middle school, which has yet to be done. And $54,360 for structural reinforcement of the connector roof at the middle school, uh, which has been paid for uh, and had an actual cost of $72,000 plus. Uh, there will be a meeting of the uh, Town Council and School Board Chairs, the Superintendent and the uh, Town Manager and the Finance Chair of the School Board and the Town Council to discuss how those uh, dollars will be spent in the uh, upcoming future or allocated. Uh, the other thing I would like to have the public aware that at 6.30 on all regularly scheduled school board meetings we will be having a finance committee meeting. Uh, in this uh, upstairs superintendent's conference room, uh, and that is a public meeting. And that will be at the next school board meeting, even though it's not a regularly scheduled school board meeting. Thank you. Any other comments? What is our cash surplus? Do we know that yet? Uh, yes, we do. I'll get it in a minute. Excuse well, tell me, me later. That's okay. I just had it. Let's see, let me rethink this. On second thought, maybe we don't want anybody to know. <laughs> <laughs> I withdraw the question. It's public information. The amount is $85,369.20. Thank you. Sorry, it took me so long to find it. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, the next is the policy sub subcommittee report. Loretta Pond is the chairman, but I think she's deferring to the superintendent. Okay. <laughs> well, I, since it is summer, we haven't had um, as many meetings as we might have in the regular. But um, again, tied to some of the incidents that I was alluding to under uh, the Teaching Tolerance Committee, uh, I felt that it was important for us to review two policies which are on the agenda tonight. I'll mention them uh, specifically when we get to them on student discipline and the use of uh, uh, any kind of uh, corporal force by staff. Uh, those are issues that are in our policy book and we were in the process of reviewing them anyway, but I felt that uh, we needed to review them this summer and have them ready for the start of school to clarify some uh, issues. Um, that was mainly the uh, the focus of uh, the one policy subcommittee meeting we've had since our last meeting. Any comments? Uh, next, Town Center Committee, Rosemary Reed. Uh, yes, the Town Center uh, subcommittee uh, planning committee is meeting right now at 1226 Shore Road, so I'm missing tonight's meeting. But at the last meeting, the committee began a discussion of the appropriate permitted uses um, that are in the Town Center. And for purposes of the school board meeting, I'm happy to report the school is one of those permitted uses. Um, the other thing that I would uh, like to say about this committee uh, and it also ties back to an item that was on the town council um, agenda last night as a public hearing and will be on the September 14th meeting is there is a discussion and a decision that will be made in the very near future uh, about stoplights or proposed stoplights uh, in the town center um, Shore Road, Scott Dye Road and Route 77 intersection and the town council is encouraging public input on that and since it does impact the school parents who travel that uh, often may want to get to their town councilors or get to the public hearing september 14th thank you um community team rosemary uh yes the community team has uh, recently adopted and clarified their mission and i will read uh what it is word for word we are a cross-section of community members who promote health and well-being through education involved awareness resources and forums for discussion we do this for the whole community with a primary focus on the school age committee uh, community members the reason i point this out and read this at the time is uh first of all it was uh just solidified on the 29th of june so it is timely 
but also before school starts uh, it's generally a time for parents to determine what activities they'll be involved in and they may decide that the community team uh, is a, an organization that they would like to uh, spend some of their time learning more about uh, the community team works to promote and encourage healthy lifestyles and the education of healthy lifestyles uh, it is not limited only to substance abuse issues, although that does take a uh, focus. The upcoming activities, uh, just as a, a sample, is that the community team plans to sponsor a seventh grade one day mini retreat. They will work to provide education and awareness presentations for parents of middle school children. They will provide a speaker on parenting for parents of elementary children. They will also support project graduation by making community, the community aware of its purposes. So you can see for the purposes of school board representation on the community team, it is um, a very important uh, element um, of our children and it does impact our students or can impact our students K-12. And if anybody's interested in finding out more about the community team, I'd be very happy to direct you to to the right person and you can just call me at 7670718. Thank you. Any other comments? We'll move on to unfinished business. The first is a second reading of school board policy file IHB concerning class size. Um, I think I will defer to the ex-chairman in case there are any so this was a policy under your first reading came under your tutelage as chairman. Anybody have any comments? Are there any further revisions that need to be made to this policy? This essentially sets class size, recommended class size for kindergarten 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, and special education. Seeing none, I entertain a motion. Rosemary. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept uh, the policy as written. Do I see a second? Second. Any further comment? All those in favor? Seven, uh, six, zero. Uh, next, under unfinished business is the a report on the athletic training rules which were addressed to us in June. You all have a letter from the principal of the high school, a letter that went out to parents on the final draft. Um, there were 30 parents surveyed. And this is, has to do with athletic policy for training rules on substance abuse, use and abuse. Any comment from the board? Rosemary. Yes, I have a question. Uh, the question has been raised to me and I wasn't sure how to answer it and maybe Mr. DeFusco uh, could if he didn't mind. Um, the, the question that students are raising is, is this a condition of playing as the former contract was, do you know, and um, parents were wondering if they also have to sign, as in the past, and I'm, I didn't know the answer to either one of those questions. I know that uh, Mr. Weatherby has met with the coaches, and, and as far as answering your question, I believe the parents are going to be asked to sign simply recognizing that the rules are there, not that they are, you know, as far as uh, their knowledge that, that, that their, child, their student is, is, is a part of that. Um, the other question you raised about um, whether the student would have to sign that to participate, I believe the answer is yes. Thank you. Okay. Any, Mark? Do you mention that the various teams will have uh, a number of policies from other schools in Maine, in Western Maine Conference? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just wondering if we could get a copy of those, um, I, I, or at least I would be very interested in a copy to see how this progresses in terms of what our students and coaches put together and how that relates to the rest of the uh, teams throughout the region. Um, I'll be seeing Mr. Weatherby on Monday and he has that information. I'll, I'll see that it gets to all of you. So you have that. Any other comments? 
can. Um, I, I was just a little confused about um, if they don't have to turn in their rules until the end of the first week of a sports season and the previous rules are still in effect mm -hmm. then? That's correct. What, so the, the signed contract from before is still in force now? Mm -hmm. What about kids who are coming, coming in fresh and haven't played a sport yet? Are they just not covered by? I think it would be in, 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 with the idea that um, the, new se the high school season is, has begun. And again, that does start, I believe, on Monday of next week. And at that point, I think that the teams will all be addressed by their coaches. Okay, so they're all going to be under the understanding as of Monday that they have to follow the old contract exactly, until, until they have a new contract, until a new even if they haven't signed anything. Correct. That meets with your That's approval? Well, I, I don't know <laughs> how enforceable it is, but... At this point in time, it's essentially training and um, scrimmage Correct. before school starts. Right. So we haven't really got into actual game. Any other comments? Seeing none. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to new business. Uh, first under new business is goals for 1992-93. I'll defer to the superintendent. Um, I'm still collecting uh, suggestions, specific suggestions from the board. We do have, as my understanding is, we will have the workshop um, on the 24th. I just want to confirm that. Uh, what I will do is send out individual copies of what I have. I, as you know, last year I tried to summarize those for you, and I, I will make some kind of summary so that if there's any handwriting issue, uh, I'm good at reading handwriting, we'll get those summarized. But I do have the folder with me if anybody wants to look at that just to see what other people have passed in at this point. Um, I do find them remarkably consistent. And I think I'm sensing from what I've seen so far that your sense is the same as mine, that the upcoming year is one of implementation, one of uh, probably firming up a sense of priorities. And obviously, as I talked with the administrators, I mentioned earlier in this meeting, we clearly have to figure out how much we can do. Um, you know, what are the pieces that we can do um, first and we're getting some kind of, of suggested implementation timeline for you. So we'll come back with those suggestions too. Since this is the second time that the superintendent has alluded to the school board workshop on goals on Monday, August 24th, I think we need to confirm that now. I haven't cr been able to cross with every member of the board. Does anyone here presently have any problem with that evening? Only philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> And my understanding that the administrators are invited to this? Oh, yes. Okay. And any member of the public? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's confirmed. Very good. Okay. Next is personal requests. Okay. We have a number of items here. We've tried to separate them out a bit, um, and I'll take them in the order in which they are. Make sure I get the right. Um, we did give you a VITA sheet, uh, which I hope you've had a chance to look at. Uh, frankly, we've been very pleased with the um, applications and with the interviews. In some cases, it's been difficult to choose among uh, two or three very good, uh, well-qualified finalists. What I'm going to do is read the list as it exists in your, um, uh, in your packet. And I think it would be appropriate for a single vote to take the list as I read it. I will then separate out and have a brief explanation of how we're handling the kindergarten specials because they are not on teacher contract. They are a contract in service and that is not necessary for you to vote on that. But I do want a chance to explain how that will be handled and who is involved. So uh, I'll get my right list here. Uh, one that's true. We have, excuse me, before I do that, probably to, to make this all fit together, there is one issue on the social worker part-time. If you will look at the list of nominations for new teachers, um, we need to take up the memo, and I think I have that, uh, let me see, where is that? Okay, it's an accompanying memo, but it's not listed separately on the agenda, okay. Uh, I hope that you've all had a chance to read it. If you have any questions, I'll summarize it very quickly. 
Uh, for the last several years, the high school has had the services of a social worker, but that has been a contracted service. Just as you will see when I get into the discussion about the kindergarten specials, we hire a number of people during the course of a year, many of them through special, uh, for special needs, uh, through special education department, um, that we do not put on teacher contract. We simply hire them for a specific number of hours per week and for a specific uh, uh, situation, and therefore uh, we do not form the same kind of relationship, ongoing relationship that we form when we put somebody on teacher contract. That is the uh, situation that has existed for the last few years at the high school for the social worker who has primarily uh, been concentrating on drug and alcohol issues. Over a period of time, however, at least the two years, the two budgets that I've been dealing with, the high school has raised the issue that they felt that the time was coming when it would be um, appropriate to broaden the scope of that particular position to hire a social worker and to form a relationship with a school district, somebody who, in fact, is under teacher contract uh, as social workers are typically on if they are actually connected with the school. That means they are there on a regular basis depending on how many, uh, whether how part time it is. In this case it's approximately half time. Um, and after a good deal of discussion as outlined in this memo, I do make that recommendation to you and I think it would be appropriate for you to discuss that and take a motion um, on that so that I can then uh, presumably add that name to the list here it is on the list. Questions? The salary plus benefits is the 20000 it. We are So simply, it's not benefits in addition to the 20000 right. We are adjusting the time so that it will fit the budget we have. And as you will notice, the, so, the particular social worker that's being recommended is would place very high due to her her master's plus 30. So it's within within that uh, half time uh, step. Any further discussion? Do I hear a motion to to change this to a half time um, teaching position? I so move. Um, do I want a second before we have a motion? I mean, a question? Do I hear a second? Loretta? Um, any further comment? Rosemary? Is it a point 0.5 or a point 0.6? It's somewhere between. What we are trying to do is, is stay within our budget, and the exact amount will be worked out as we, we had uh, ideas on vacation, and just before we walked out the door, we had confirmed this, and so we sat down and worked it out as best we could. But it actually falls between the 0.5 and the 0.6, and we will translate that into uh, something that is so many hours or so many days, and it will be within the budget. We can amend it to be 0.55 if someone uh, is yeah. I, I think with just <laughs> the use of the word part-time is sufficient. I was just interested. I, I, as a finance committee chair, I was thinking of every dollar, but thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, 6-0. And having settled that issue, then I will go down through the list. At the high school, part-time English position, Tracy Brennan. Physical education, part-time, Scott Shea. Art, which you just to refresh your memory, is a uh, leave of absence for one of our art teachers from September, September through January, Mary Hart. Uh, the social worker position that we just voted on, Kathleen Lisa. At the middle school, grade seven, social studies and science, Rachel Garrett, grade eight, social studies and language arts, Joanne Dowd, uh, speech therapist, half time apiece, Deborah Casey, Nancy Entwistle, special education uh, at the middle school, Ellen Brady, and also a part time, Eugenie Moore. At Pond Cove, an art one year position, uh, Rita Swadrowski, and special education part time, also one year position. Lynn Meter. I might explain that that one-year position at special education part-time is what is making it possible for us to send uh, Peg Lewis to reading recovery, and we all we discuss that as part of the budget. Um, just for your information, Rita is here this evening, as is Scott, who's sitting in the back here. I entertain a motion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rosemary. I'll second it. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for new teachers for the 1992-93 school year. Here, second. Peter. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. I would just like to add a comment on having sat on uh, several of the high school interviews, I was very impressed this year by the quality of the candidates that we had to choose from. And, and a couple committee assignments, it was very hard to make a choice. And I believe the fellow board members who also sat on other interviewing committees found we had a high quality of candidates this year. It's been a very consistent pattern. Welcome aboard. Um, I'd like to explain at the bottom of the page, uh, we uh, have worked out an agreement as a contracted service with three specialists, Catherine Berriman in music education, Judy Faust in visual arts education, and Maureen Houston in movement education. Uh, what we ran into in trying to staff these uh, specialties at the kindergarten center, they had been staffed by people who were teaching at the K-4 Pine Cove level or K-3 with some grade four being taught by other specialists because they were in the middle school building and because of the numbers that were um, made some people available. Uh, now with a higher number of um, middle school students, not just because we have transferred grade five to the middle school, but also because, just to remind you, that we now have our large classes all the way up through the eighth grade, uh, even as recently as last year, we had a small class at the eighth grade. That is no longer true. Our entire K-8 now, um, our classes that exceed 100, which is what we've been seeing at the high school and at the upper grade level. We've created a situation not only for stretching the staff we have to give uh, special services, uh, not special services, not special education, we're talking about art, music, and, and phys ed, uh, but also how to take into consideration uh, traveling back and forth between Pine Cove and the high school and to furthermore um, the time frame that the kindergarten teachers uh, needed given the fact they have different youngsters morning and afternoon. It was a really complicated puzzle and I want to complicate, uh, complicate. <laughs> <laughs> I am complicating it. Uh, but anyway, I want to compliment um, Beth and, and Nancy St. John for having the patience to work this through. Um, I too was pleased with the enthusiasm that people were calling in about this. We advertised, we thought, is anybody going to understand this ad? <laughs> and I also want to thank Connie Brown for her great patience and I also want to take this opportunity to uh, comment that nobody who hasn't worked in a central office can begin to understand the literally hundreds and I, th I really think it's more like thousands of phone calls that Connie handles in a time like this. Um, every ad we put in uh, with very few exceptions, brings at least 100 replies, uh, some of them in writing, some of them just over the phone to get particulars. Um, Connie is endlessly patient in trying to understand what the position is and also what the uh, needs of the person calling in may be. She's a wonderful representative of our school system, so thank you very much. But it is also very, very time consuming. Um, very good. Moving on, request for an unpaid leave of absence. I included a uh, memo in. Can I just make a oh, clarification sorry, yes. on the kindergarten center allied arts team? This is a contracted position, so that's why we don't have to vote on that's it. That's exactly right. It's what you just voted on going from to establish a contract position for the social worker. We've been dealing with that uh, as a 2,000 line item. Um, for years. So essentially they're consultants. Yes. Uh, you had in your folder a letter from Rebecca Wing, a music teacher, grades five through seven, uh, explaining that she and her husband are planning for a trip that says trekking in the mountains of Nepal, northern India, and exploring the traditions of the indigenous people. I can't tell you how romantic that sounds, but imagine <laughs> when you get there, it's a little less than super romantic. <laughs> But um, at any rate, she is giving us very early notice that she would like this unpaid leave of absence later in the year. And uh, since it was important to her plans to bring it to you and get feedback back from you at this time, uh, absence from March 1st to the end of the academic year, I told her that I would take it up with you at this time. Do, will we have difficulty filling, it, filling a position like that? 
well, at that time? Well, frankly, from the feedback we've had so far this summer in dealing with a variety of issues, music may not be the, in, in the, the readiest of all, but I think we can assure you we will be able to do that. Do just to add to that, too, Rebecca and I had a conversation about just that, and she assured me that before she went off trekking through the mountains, um, she would help us find someone who would fill a position with great quality. So that made me feel better about it. Okay. And I think that um, I will say that while well, we've been dealing with some of these things, the, um, the community of artists and specialists do seem to be able to do that. The requests we've had so far, they've been bringing in good replacements. So. I would I would recommend that that you grant your request. Okay. Entertain a motion, Loretta. Yes. Second. Seconded. Rosemary. Any comment? All those in favor? Six zero. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay. We have had a couple of resignations uh, that I want to call to your attention for your vote. Sandy Wiest, who has been teaching for us for two years at the fourth grade level, uh, her letter indicates to you that she's been offered really a very exciting opportunity to continue work that um, she started as a representative of the state of Maine for the new standards project um, at the University of Illinois. She will be also enrolling in a doctoral program there. So we wish you well, Sandy, and thank you for all that you've done with us while you've been here. And uh, since we might as well make this one motion, I think we have another resignation, which was from Beth Ann Dixon, special education teacher at Pond Cove, who was with us last year, uh, did not come from the state, and has decided to return to her home base in New York. Uh, we have the next one listed as a separate one as a retirement, but there is no particular reason why you cannot accept all, do all of these with one vote. We did separate it out because it is a different situation is Mary Bruns, who has been with the district for many years and has made a friend, I'm sure, of everybody that is uh, working in the district as well as many, many students and parents. Uh, Mary had a health problem uh, towards the end of school and the advice of her family and doctor has decided to retire. Um, and uh, certainly I'm sure you would share my feeling that uh, she deserves a great deal of thanks all that she has done. Uh, I am, however, also glad to tell you that she and I have discussed the fact that Mary has been working for us, worked for us last year as a part-time remedial reading teacher at the grades <coughs> four or five level, and uh, half of her assignment was to work with us as our certification officer. She was continuing the transition from career ladder. She spent, uh, she was the director of career ladder. She was very helpful last year as we were um, reworking our evaluation instrument. Um, the respect that the staff has for Mary is, um, is just invaluable in working through some of these transitions. Uh, and I have discussed with her and she is uh, willing to continue with us on a consultative basis as our certification officer. We have no replacement and this is a necessary piece for the way uh, locals are now required to deal with certification. She will also continue to work with us in staff development. She uh, spearheaded the exceptionality course, for instance, that we gave in-house last year that we will be giving again. Uh, and recently she has uh, actually, on more than one occasion last year, she has begun to be interested in total quality and she and I have had some discussions about that and I'm sure she'll be very helpful in organizing some of those activities. So I am recommending then tonight that you accept her retirement with the understanding that um, we will be continuing on a consultative basis, her work with us. I entertain a motion to accept the resignation of Sandy Wiest, the resignation of Beth Ann Dixon, and the resignation retirement of Mary E. Bruns. Mark? Any second? Roseberry? Any comment? All those in favor? Six zero. Okay. Um, next thing we have here is a list of um, attachments for co-curricular as well as a separate list <coughs> for two appointments for the fall sports season. I would ask to remove the um, 
let's see, two adjustments to this list. Um, the fifth grade uh, team leader position is being reviewed there at the request of the uh, party listed. And we will uh, pin that down at our next meeting. And we are adding uh, the kindergarten team leader, Gigi Zimprich. I also want to clarify, because I, I think it may cause some confusion, uh, we have two positions on here that are not team leaders that are uh, slated to receive the stipend that is was, well, whatever it will eventually be negotiated to, but the position that you agreed to in the revised evaluation instrument, that one of curriculum leader or somebody who is regarded as a person working on a specific area. We've suggested a $500 stipend for that and have put um, provisions for that in the budget. Uh, the exact number of that is yet to be determined through final negotiations. But the two positions that are uh, that and not team leaders would be two from Pond Cove, the Guidance Education Pro Programming Coordinator and Health Education Coordinator, Sarah Berman and Mandy Garmy. But it would be appropriate for you to take a vote for the entire list with the understanding that those are not team leaders. Could I ask the principal to explain essentially the duties or responsibilities of those two positions since they are new? Uh, both Sarah and Mandy, as the health educator, um, will be picking up pieces of the curriculum this year and be teaching in classrooms um, periodically. And likewise would be in attendance at the Panko team meetings. Um, they aren't team leaders in that they're not supervising other teachers, but they are links between teams and between teachers and between parents. And they're very, I, I see them as very critical part of, uh, of the team. So these are essentially additional duties to what their primary assignments are? Yes. Thank you. Also, I need a clarification on the grade eight team. I need, how do, how do you, schedule for team leaders? Well, it's, it's an example of creative problem solving brought to you by the eighth grade team of teachers. When Hope Brown retired, it left a real void in our school and she had been the eighth grade team leader for three or four years and had done a wonderful job. When we put out the offer for and the openings for team leaders for the coming school year, my office was not overwhelmed with responses from the eighth grade team. So I went back to the team and we talked a lot about what we needed from the team leader and was there a way that the team felt that we could solve this problem. One of the issues, we knew we were going to be getting a new faculty member in the eighth grade and so we did talk about, <clears throat> gee we could have this new person come on and <laughs> they could also be team leader. <laughs> However, um, the veteran faculty did say, but wait a minute, that's really not fair because the person needs to get acclimated to Cape Elizabeth and to find out what we're about. So maybe we can convince someone of that the second year that they're here, but not the first. And the reason that the eighth grade team, no one jumped forward is that many of them were involved in many other professional activities. And they really felt that there was no one person who had the time to commit to this one responsibility. So I left it in hands of the team and asked them to come up with something with a proposal to come to me with that they felt they believed in and that they felt that it would work. And so what they brought to me was a proposal that they would job share the team leadership and that actually is done by semesters and in each semester you have a team. The first semester Mary McGuire and Mike Madden are going to team the position. And the second semester, Rolly Moore and Linda Hull are going to team the position. We have talked a lot about the communication and the specific duties. Uh, for instance, one, Mike Madden is going to do the budget issue so that that's clearly in one person's hand. And I feel very comfortable with it. I wouldn't feel comfortable with it if every team in the middle school decided to have this um, type of structure um, without having seen if it would work. But I do believe it's going to work because the eighth grade team very much believes that it's going to work. I would gladly invite you back in uh, eight months or nine months to let us know how it's proceeding. I'll certainly be glad <laughs> to do that. Mark? Hey, I just have a comment on that uh, setup. 
And I, I certainly don't begrudge the teachers opportunity to do that. And for this year, I think it's a reasonable way to address the uh, problem. However, I think it does point to a significant problem in this particular setup, and that is that either, uh, and certainly one of the problems is that there's not enough money allocated for that position to make it an attractive position. Um, so I, I think that as we identify leadership individuals within the school system, we need to reimburse them appropriately. And just as an initial uh, point for the upcoming budget, I, I think that we should seriously consider making the amount of reimbursement for these types of jobs more significant so that it will be an attractive position. There will be leadership in the position itself, and there will be competition among the teachers to pursue that job for financial and other reasons. I, I think that's an excellent idea. The other possibility that maybe uh, this is signifying is that at the middle school level, perhaps a, t a grade level leader may not be appropriate. Perhaps in the middle school, a structure such as a math leader for six, seven, eight, and a reading, some other stipended positions where their task would be more easily defined. Um, because in the eighth grade, since ch classes change, teachers have specific areas, it's very difficult to coordinate an entire eighth grade when their jobs are so subspecialized, perhaps in middle school we should look at a different formula for providing leadership within the middle school that will be more coherent and allow each area to have direct leadership uh, throughout the system. I, I think those are, are interesting points and we can always look at them. The one thing I would like to, to point out though that a middle school, we do try to be very integrated with all of our things and not get so subject specific that we forget some of the other issues that we're about as well. And the team leadership positions, we have worked real hard over the last few years as the team leadership group to define what those positions were, to talk about what the responsibilities are, and to make them appealing to people to give a try to work in that. I think some of the points about reimbursement, I think some of the points that you made earlier about a building committee are also very true of anyone who serves in a team leadership position not only in the middle school but throughout our system, it is extremely time consuming. And that is more of what I heard from these people is a concern about the time issue um, and being able to address that um, and looking at things as a team. But we would be glad to look at all of those things. Rosemary? Yeah, I, I uh, also have a concern uh, with the four people sharing a leadership role. I, I did want to ask Nancy, how many eighth grade teachers are there not counting the allied arts? Not counting the allied arts, we have, well, we have portions of eighth grade teachers because we have, uh, in foreign language, there will actually be three different teachers teaching eighth grade classes next year in the foreign languages. So we have portions of those teachers assigned to the foreign language. We have one other full-time teacher um, assigned and another six-tenths teacher assigned to the So besides the .6 math teacher and the new, um, teacher, the four vet, who, who is a, a new person and a part-time, one of your four leaders is part-time, and one is a coach, and two are full-time. Th that is correct, and they looked at that very carefully. The other person we have on the eighth grade team that I forgot is we do have a special education person who's on our eighth grade team. That person also happens to be new to our faculty this coming year. When they work this out, I ask them to work very carefully about being sure that they partnered with someone they felt comfortable with, that they had talked about who was going to be responsible for different issues. We have had one formal meeting already. I will be meeting with the eighth grade in team in its entirety next week in um, an evening in my home. And we're going to be talking about some of that and about the communication and about the responsibility and making sure that the things that need to go through the team leadership are very clear and the things that they need to work on as a grade level are also very clear for them. But what you basically have here, almost, not perfect, but almost, is you have the veterans of the eighth grade team saying, okay, we'll share this for next year. We do have part of our assistant principal also teaches two classes in the eighth grade. So the other people are sort of new, are new, or part of them belongs to the eighth grade. Any further questions before the superintendent entertains her list of nominations? <laughs> I guess we can proceed. Okay, I'll read that list. Um, grade reps, uh, grade one, Nancy Rollis, grade two, uh, 
uh, Dottie Anderson, grade three, Ogden Williams, grade four, Andrew Womack McNair, grade five, as I said, we were, will hold till next time. Grade six, Steve Conley, grade seven, Jill Blackwood, the eighth grade team of Linda Hall, Mike Madden, Mary McGuire, and Willie Moore. Special education at Pond Cove, Sandy Burley, special education at Middle School, Carolyn Russ, Allied Arts, Pond Cove, Sherry Robinson, Allied Arts Middle School, Hayden Atwood, and the two positions we've already discussed, which are not team leadership positions, but curriculum pieces, Sarah Berman, Mandy Garmy, and the foreign language at the middle school, Mary Ellen Tracy. I might remind you that is a new team leadership position established as part of the budget process. Oh, excuse me, the kindergarten, thank you. Yeah. The kindergarten, J.G. Zimbridge. I need to leave that out. I entertain a motion. Okay, I move the list be uh, approved as read by the superintendent. Do I hear a second? Rosemary, any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? 6-0. And I should have added in, uh, but never mind, we'll make it a separate vote. The um, coaching assignments, we have two tonight. Boys JV soccer, Mike Hayes, and eighth grade boys soccer, Scott Shea. I enter a question? No. I entertain a motion, Rosemary. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move that we accept the additional coaching assignments for the 1991-90, excuse me, 1992-93 school year. Do we hear a second? Loretta, any further comment? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. I do have a comment. I think it's nice that we can uh, meet Scott Shea for the first time tonight as a high school phys ed teacher and then vote on him a second time as the eighth grade boys soccer coach. Congratulations. Uh, we now move on to school board policies, a first reading. The two policies this evening are the uh, student discipline and corporal punishment and use of force. I made mention brief mention of them earlier in the meeting. The language at the top of the student discipline is a language that is in the current um, policy book. It's very sparse and part of our policy manual review, as you may call, includes MSMA review suggested new language. Uh, however, because the issues that are involved in the companion policy of corporal punishment use of force are so sensitive, difficult to pin down, and in reading that, we felt that the uh, language was uh, uh, either too loose or too narrow. Um, I asked the attorneys to review both of these policies. What you have before you are uh, not only the MSMA suggested language, but also in the shaded area are suggestions that have been added by the attorney review and any existing language that uh, they suggest uh, taking out has a line through it. And I think the dittoing makes it possible for you to see the difference. Um, in my agenda notes to you, I did suggest that we add to the second policy on corporal punishment and use of force. Um, the under, in any case where a staff member uses significant force dealing with a student, the staff member shall immediately report the incident to the building principal. The principal shall investigate the incident, draft a written report of the incident, and report the incident to the superintendent of schools. I would like to add a fourth piece to that procedure, which is to immediately contact the family. Uh, there would be times when it might be the principal, it might be the teacher involved. Um, these kinds of issues uh, are certainly not simple, and that the sooner the family is notified and involved in a discussion of what happened, the better. Um, I will ask you to vote on these as a second reading at our next meeting in two weeks because I, I do intend to discuss these as policies with our administrative staff to be included in a faculty packet for the beginning of school because I think that uh, not only here but in other places we have seen some confusions as to exactly what the parameters of the legal statute on use of force with students. And I think these two policies do spell it out pretty well. So on student discipline file, JG, we're replacing the top part? That's right. Okay. We would keep the 
Oh, excuse me. Yeah, we are replacing. I think. Okay, so it would the, the new policy would start with good discipline in schools. Correct. Okay, so we are eliminating the top part. That's right. Okay, and under corporal punishment and use of force, under what the principal shall do, we would add number four: notify parent (parentheses s) or legal guardian of the incident as soon as possible. That's or, correct. Okay. Or do you want a timely, in a timely, or? I think as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Okay. Uh, Anne? I just have a couple comments about the student discipline policy. Um, I, I kind of liked some of the language in the beginning part, um, uh, the about not relying on students for performance and levels of expectations should be established and adhered to. And I was going to add to that and explain to students. Um, one thing that seems to me, the, really the only thing that seems to be lacking is tying the students into this at all. There's nowhere in here does it say that the teachers will not only have the standards but communicate those clearly to the students. Are you suggesting we just keep that first paragraph? In well, I'm, I'm not sure we really need to if, if somehow we can just incorporate maybe a sen sentence in there um, somewhere just about or maybe just take that whole, um, the lat, maybe just the two last sentences of that original piece. Any other, Rosemary? I like I like the whole paragraph. I think it sets up the spirit of the policy, um, but we I can, can live. keep it. That's, that's that's up to you, Mark. I I, I like some of the. Uh, wording there also perhaps we just refer it back to the policy subcommittee for review <laughs> <laughs> return that I believe that happened last year on occasion <laughs> <laughs> okay it has been recommended that the the student discipline policy go back to the the policy subcommittee to review whether we should incorporate this first paragraph which is in our existing policy okay. as part of a total new policy I don't have any strong feelings on that at all. I mean, I think that it, I hear what you're saying, and if you'd like to do that, we can simplify our policy. But, um, Since we have two members of the policy subcommittee here this evening, and I know well, the I third have, member is not available and will not be available until our next meeting, I will, if they want to confer right now, they can. Well, well <laughs> I was, what I was uh, groping for very quickly was whether or not we could just put the both together, as I think, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, somebody else suggested. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, first reading, I think you, you probably could, uh, mm -hmm. but I think we'd have to you know, sort of read it we'll read and it think about it for 24 hours, but uh, uh, just just very, do you all have the same reaction that you could just have two, uh, these two paragraphs? I thought that was, I thought this was just being added to the original policy. Okay. And, but but I, I still would like to make the point that I, I do think it should say something about explaining the policy, the, um, the discipline or the expectations to the students. You could just say consistently applied and communicated <coughs> or something that simple, couldn't you? Okay, your recommendations have been noted. Uh, Rosemary? Yes, I, I had a comment on uh, file JGA. Uh, in the second paragraph, the use of the word staff members. And I would like, um, in the first paragraph, it says, no person employed by the school department uh, shall inflict or cause to be inflicted corporal punishment upon a pupil. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering why, in the second paragraph, it, it became staff members, and if there's a difference. Um, staff members from no person employed? Yes. Is there anyone employed in our school department who is not considered staff? Uh, we might have somebody in there who was employed on a contracted service, for instance. We, that is we that voted a few of those tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're staff members by any reasonable okay. definition, mm -hmm. contract or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I, I think it's probably more literary, although I didn't write it, uh, rather than just repeat staff members or no person employed. 
I just wanted to clarify. Thank uh, you. I, I don't know. I don't think it means anything, but uh, the, the, the question's a good one. Does it mean something to somebody else? That, uh, it might be uh, good I was idea. thinking of coaches, for example, yeah. on well, the playing sort of field members. or yeah. the, that, uh, my sense of that is non non-teaching coaches. Right. I think it, uh, this is an important enough issue. It needs to be, uh, I might suggest that I read it uh, in its current form uh, and try to also uh, clarify a little bit what the law says because I think this is, a, this is a sobering issue and people can get caught in the middle of situations very easily, very simply, that do not seem to be a particular uh, force uh, and, and so forth, only to find that somebody else has a different interpretation. So trying to find uh, the line here is very important, and I would like to make a few comments about that if you think it's appropriate. Okay. okay. First of all, I think the, it's important for people to understand there is a statute covering use of force by teachers and by anybody who is in a position of authority with, with uh, young people. Um, it is uh, within the scope of the law to use force if it is to prevent injury to others, um, bodily harm to the youngster himself, herself, uh, to a person to protect oneself. Um, and it is generally interpreted, and there are many gray areas here, it is generally interpreted to mean that you will use only the force that is sufficient to do that. But for instance, if you have children who are out of control, or you have a fight, um, or you have any attack from one student to another or attack on a, a staff member, uh, there certainly is no prohibition in the law to use what force is necessary to control that situation. Um, unfortunately, uh, tempers can flare and in situations it can be arguable was that force needed or necessary. And then t also the other uh, real issue that can be very problematic is the degree of force and the way in which it was um, used or the sequence in which it was used. Uh, that's why this is not just a flat, simple statement that says no staff member will ever lay hands on a student. There are times when it becomes necessary to do that. Uh, but at the same time, those times are few and far between in the normal school situation. So what this policy says, no person employed by the school department shall inflict or cause to be inflicted corporal punishment upon a pupil. Corporal punishment is usually interpreted to mean that, that it's not a matter of using force to restrain a situation, but f some kind of force is used to make a point. Uh, and uh, frankly, when I was going to grammar school, uh, every recess, kids were lined up in the corridor, and the principal, uh, you held out your hand, and you got so many whacks on the hand, particularly obstreperous, you had to turn your hand over, and you got the wax on your knuckles. Um, that is not a practice that is tolerated anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I would make one uh, observation. I can't resist this. I think I've told this story before, but uh, my uh, daughter is going into her third year teaching in a rural public school in North Carolina. In her first year, she found that the teachers all had paddles. Mm -hmm. And she was appalled with this. And uh, so she uh, decided to uh, try some other form of discipline. But first, she decided to hold a vote among her students whether they would have corporal punishment or some other form of corporal punishment. And they voted for the paddle. <laughs> it's what they knew. And she still doesn't use it, I might add, but uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, th that's a lesson, I guess, in diversity. It is. <laughs> but we're not allowed, that, that, that's not the diversity we're after. <laughs> yes, don't let anybody misinterpret no. that, uh, my comments. It's merely an anecdote. The issue of, uh, in the state of Maine, the, the statute, as I very briefly outlined it, makes it clear that corporal punishment is not allowed, period. It is, however, possible to use, uh, some students will get the idea that nobody can legally lay hands on them, but there are circumstances uh, where the, uh, that is necessary to control a situation and prevent harm. Um, sometimes that, that arguably becomes a gray area, and that's what this policy is trying to condemn. But no corporal punishment. Um, we read this right so I don't read the ones that are crossed out. Staff members may only use and apply such amounts of force as, it should be such amount of force as is reasonable and necessary to prevent physical injury to any person 
and to prevent the destruction of school property. Any such acts shall not be construed to constitute corporal punishment within the meaning and intent of this policy. In any case where a staff member uses significant force dealing with a student, and that goes into the issues. Uh, what we have crossed out is some of the language that was in our existing policy that we felt was uh, really almost either redundant or confusing. Um, there, for instance, to restrain a pupil from an act of wrongdoing is a pretty broad statement. If one may use physical force to, to guess that somebody's going to do something, uh, we're opening up a can of worms for teachers and we thought it was easier just to say don't do it. Um, this will no doubt spark some discussion at the school level. Um, we will be talking about it administratively. Uh, there will be some, we, I'm sure we do not have a widespread use of force in our schools, but at the same time there are times when people um, will put a hand on somebody's shoulder or direct them in a certain direction. I'm sure there will be some clarification of that. People want to know exactly uh, what are the proper ways of doing it. Uh, what you know the what ifs and I also want to be very open about communicating this with parents we do not want to create a situation where um, teachers feel that they are hampered from doing what they feel is necessary to have an orderly atmosphere on the other hand we want to be careful for everybody's protection the rights of the uh, children primarily but also teacher rights so that they do not walk into a situation where they are um, treading outside lines that they should be careful about any and I just um, was wondering if there are going to be administrative guidelines to go along with these that flesh these out a little more as far as procedures to follow. Well, I have, I have some general things to do to discuss with the administrators, and um, we can certainly talk about what would be useful. Um, perhaps as a result of that, we'll get back to you, but this is the essence of the board policy. Any further comments? Um, well, I, I hate to keep going back and forth, but well, what are we going to do about that paragraph on the other policy? You mean the, the current policy? Yes, as such. Are we going to so um, vote on it next time? Right. Um, because there are things in that I don't like. Motivate more, demand more, expect more. More what? And <laughs> 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 I'm. I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, less is more. That's <laughs> I don't like that. That's and I then think that the teachers should too. not rely on students for performance. What does that mean? Well, that's sort of why I said perhaps yeah. we could just do that. Uh, what I think I will do is... Um, but yeah, I like your point of, of saying that, that it needed to be... Uh, no, it was your suggestion yeah. that, that the students be included somehow. Well, tell them. I'll read it again and see what I think is the essence of what people like there and insert it somewhere here and get it out to people and see perhaps at a goal setting meeting, okay. which is before a board meeting, we can have a, uh, an opportunity to look at that. Okay. Everyone satisfied? Yeah, I think it, 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 I just want to make sure that we're going to try to get to the second reading. I, it's very okay. important to me. Because I, I think you can take the first two sentences, for example, and you could say they mean the same thing. And uh, I, I think it would be a shame to you know, have this delay a month. So I, I think whatever we do procedurally, we ought to get to a second reading okay. I think if, if that's there, permissible. I think if the draft is ready for our workshop, it gives us time to add any comments that could be added or amended by the next evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. I will do that. Okay. It's referred back to committee and will come back to us for a second reading in the end of this month. Yeah. Our next one is appointment to the Community Service Advisory Commission. And this is uh, Deborah Riley, a president um, who has a number of, of ties to community <coughs> service and is willing to be on the community service board. Happy to have her. As such, I would ask you to vote to appoint her to the Community Services Advisory Commission. I entertain a motion. Yes, I'd like to nominate Debbie Bryan. A second? No, second. Peter Leslie? Any comment? I think we probably have a lot of people here who would fight to do this since we all know Debbie. <laughs> yes, I mean, you're right next to her, right? Ever, and she's my next door neighbor, but <laughs> she'll understand. 
Well, our sons went to Mexico together right. this summer, so. Uh, Yes, that's right. She's a very, she'll be very, very good. I don't perceive any collusion here, do I? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this was, I didn't know this was coming up. This is by well, actually, actually, this was a table from our last meeting. Okay. Um, I entered all those in favor. Six to zero. Okay, a reminder, dates to remember, school board workshop on goals, Monday, August 24th, 1992 at... 7.30 p.m., which will be held at 1226 Shore Road. Our next school board meeting will be Tuesday, August 25th, 1992, at 7.30 p.m. in Council Chambers. And a reminder to everyone, the first day of school is Tuesday, September 8th, 1992. Staff, September 3rd, in case any staff. When is the meeting, uh, the traditional meeting with the staff? September with the school 3rd. board sometimes. Oh. What do you mean with the school board? The first That's day the first day of school. You're invited. Okay, good. You come and join us, and uh, we will be meeting at the high school, and uh, we will have coffee. At, hmm? September 3rd. September 3rd. September 3rd. Mm -hmm. It's a Thursday. I hope that's the right day. The, well, I've said the first day of school for children is Tuesday, September 8th, 1992. Mm -hmm. I entertain a motion to adjourn. So Rosemary. Seconded by Peter. Any further discussion? Yes, go on. All those in favor? 6-0.